Wait, so you just arrived in New York. You were, mm-hmm. what, 17 or 18 at the time? 17. 17, and you booked VS. Yeah, about two years after. Two? It yeah. took you two years to book VS. It's a balance. It's about feeling good um, because we can't be 100 every day. No. It's, uh, the contrast between training for Victoria's Secret and being a mum. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I feel like a lot of people will relate to that. <laughs> Why are you in my head? <laughs> I think it's interesting for people to know, you know. (laughs) Welcome to the very first episode of the 8020 podcast. I am Georgia Sinclair, one of your hosts, and your (laughs) other host is the one and only Shanina Shaikh. And this is our first episode in our brand new set. And I feel like I need to tell a bit of a background story about why we're doing this podcast and how I actually manifested this. You did. And I feel like you did in your own way as well. So this studio is actually the same studio that a very dear friend of ours, Nicole Benham, uses for the Beyond podcast. It's just set up very differently for us. And when I was a guest on Nicole's podcast, I went in there and the first thing I felt and said to her was that I felt very triggered because I went into the studio and I thought, my God, this is so cool. I want this for myself. Mm -hmm. And I thought, screw it. I'm just going to vocalise that. So Mm. when I sat down on the chair, I said, I'm really triggered right now because this is secretly what I want for myself. And Nicole said to me, well, you can have that. And I thought, you know what, maybe I can have that. But I didn't have any immediate plans for that to happen. Mm -hmm. And we fast forward to a conversation I was having with Shanina and I said, you know, Wellness Wednesdays was such a popular thing for you on Instagram during the pandemic. You should really turn that into a into a podcast. Mm -hmm. And you said, well, why don't you do it with me? Yeah. And my initial reaction was, what business does a DJ have doing a wellness podcast? And then as I kind of ruminated on that some more, I thought, hang on, I have a lot of business Mm -hmm. doing a wellness podcast because wellness is the most important thing to me. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And now we're here here. in the very same studio. So I manifested this. You you, manifested this. I manifested this. I thank you for the introduction, Georgia. Of of course. (laughs) (laughs) No, and with saying that, I remember during the pandemic, I found a course to be magnetic with Lacey Phillips. We love her. We love her. And it's all about manifesting things that you want in your life. And I sent that to you because... Georgia was dealing with a lot of health. Her health journey is quite interesting, which we'll touch on in a second. But we wanted a change. And I think we want more um, in our lives than just our everyday industry career thing that we do nine to five. Um, there's more to us. There's a, more, there's a very interesting story, but we are interested in giving back as well. And I think that's really important. Yeah, because I feel like especially with your career, because your career is centred around your looks and looking beautiful and beauty comes from within Mm -hmm. most of it. Yes. Um, So being well and wellness has been a very integral part of your career. And I feel like people are going to be very interested, at least I know I am, to learn all of your wellness secrets. Absolutely. I think obviously to the naked eye, modelling is just like this fabulous life and we have it all together and it seems really easy and it's not It's not easy. I started when I was very young. Um, I left home when I was 17. I moved by myself to New York. My goodness. <laughs> That's How did that feel, moving was, to New York? Like from Australia, so <laughs> it is a bloody long way. <laughs> it's a long way. I was United Airlines, economy, back of the plane. Ouch. Ouch. <laughs> Nothing wrong. <laughs> but, you Still know, very blessed, but ouch. Yes. Humble beginnings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and I arrived into New York and it was snowing. Australians, we never see snow. So that was an amazing experience. Wow. Were you scared? I was so scared. I arrived I at the model's apartment which they have models' apartments. Oh, God, I've lived in one of those. Did they have roaches? <laughs> I don't know. It was Mine was pretty bad. Ten of, ten of us living in an apartment. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, that's not fun. That's not glamorous. Which I'm sh- pretty sure is illegal. Yeah. But, <laughs> hey, we yeah. did it. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, and I pretty much started my career. And the next day, pretty much I landed. The next day I went to the modeling agency and started. My, my goal was just to try like have a try the the ropes a little bit with the with New York and yeah. see how it goes for me go there for three months come back home 
So it was just three months. It was just three months. You weren't planning to. No. St- how long have you been in the US now? Uh, thirteen years. Thirteen years. Yeah, so three 13. months turned into thirteen years. Yes. Well. I mean, I can see why. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks, babe. Thank you. So, okay, so you got over there. Did you feel a lot of pressure when you arrived? Because obviously New York's a very competitive city for models. It's so not the most competitive city in the world. I think you see, like, the movies, yeah, the shows, all the modelling shows, they have this idea and uh, it's when we didn't have iPhones back, like, then too. Was it the Nokia 51? It was like a Nokia. Where you could play Snake? Yes. Yeah, I remember those. Yeah, that was I was great. getting all my Bring castings on that <laughs> and it's a lot of pressure in how you how you look your height um well not much you can do about that m- my <laughs> dna my genetics how i look and what was going on in the fashion industry hold on i want to touch on that what do you mean specifically <laughs> by that are you talking about your ethnicity ethnicity yes yeah. was it a good or a bad thing i was celebrated um for my diverse ethnicity um and just quickly my mom is Lithuanian Australian my dad is Saudi Arabian Pakistani okay that's a mix I'm really jealous of my 23 Yours. me is yeah you've seen it I've it's seen one it. whole blue circle it's the most boring 23 <laughs> and me on the planet yours must be every color under the rainbow you had a bit of greens from somewhere I had a tiny bit of green, but it, it came up as a maybe. <laughs> it's not even – it could have just been a glitch in the lab. No, I'm so oh, – yeah. beautiful. It doesn't matter. Thank you. So are you. <laughs> um, so, okay. So I'm really happy to hear that it was celebrated. So yeah. obviously – so when you turned up to New York, you, so what you're saying is you had quite a different look. I had a different look. It was celebrated, but also the, there is categories with ethnicity. Okay. And it's Caucasian, there's Asian, there's Latin and black. Okay. Um, I can kind of sway in between, but that's just not who I am. I'm like, um, I guess other, I'll tick other as a box. Yeah, no, you're a true blue Aussie. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you are. So uh, there would be times where I would go for castings and I remember I was up for a really, really big job. Um, it was um, Italian Vogue. Oh, and wow. How long after you arrived was Italian Vogue knocking on your door? Oh, it, it took me a while to get there. I also left the agency that I arrived. Well, when I arrived into New York, I went to an agency and I left there because I didn't feel like they were, you know, going into what my needs and my dreams were. And I was told that I was only going to be a commercial model and not do high fashion and not do the runway. <laughs> not do. I was told this. How wrong were they? <laughs> <laughs> I believed in myself. Because I didn't, I didn't believe it. I thought, no, there is a way, and I do believe I can get there. So I, I left the agency and went to another agency, and I booked Victoria's Secret that year. Wait, so you just arrived in New York? You mm-hmm. were what, seventeen or eighteen at the time? Seventeen. Seventeen, and you booked VS. Um, yeah, about two years after. Two. It yeah. took you two years to book VS. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. And, I mean, you've done a lot of work with VS now, haven't you? Yeah. How many times have you walked for them? Five shows. Five shows? Five shows, John. I didn't even know that. <laughs> five Did you not know years? that? No, I knew you'd done a few, but I didn't realise it was five. <laughs> that's, like, that's a lot for a VS model, right? It's it's a good amount. And that's I'm very, very lucky. I loved the shows. It was for Victoria's Secret. For me, it was one of those shows where you could show personality because – in the fashion industry, you're a coat hanger and yep. you walk um, to the light and you come back and it's all about the clothes. Obviously, it's fashion, but Victoria's Secret is all about body and celebrating women and their personality. Like you knew who the girls were and you got excited to see how a show was put together and it was fun. And you have us girls were so busy throughout the whole year. It was never a time for all of us to be in the same room together. So you're just catching up with girlfriends really as well. Oh, I love that. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And actually I want to talk a lot about VS because I feel like for a show like VS, you, so much preparation must have gone into that. I mean, I know you're genetically blessed. You're, you're born gorgeous. But mm. whenever I would watch a VS show and it was usually sitting at home in bed with a with a box of pizza because that was like my yearly ritual. I'm like, oh, I'm going to watch the hot girls with the box of pizza. Me too. Uh, oh, you do that too? Okay, good. Yeah, of course you do. Uh, <laughs> so, but I feel like, you know, every single one of those girls is so athletic mm-hmm. and fit looking. Mm-hmm. And I realise there's been a little bit of, um, 
I don't want to use the word controversy, but pressure on VS to kind of evolve their brand a bit in the last few years. And, you know, not everybody is in favour of, of, of the types of the bodies that they used to book for the runway. Mm-hmm. My personal thing is I never had a problem with it. I was thought I was always looking at you guys going, Oh, that's so cool. You know, this mm-hmm. is like you looked sort of unattainable to me. But I guess I wanna know, how do you obtain the unobtainable? Like was there a lot of pressure that went into preparing for the show? I think for me overall, uh like preparing for a show, it's like it's about feeling your best for me. You know, you can't look like a VS runway, like model every day. Like what I look like on the runway, I can't like, that's not, I can't obtain that every day. It's just not, it's not possible. That's why they talk about 80, 20. It's like, it's a balance. It's about feeling good um, because we can't be a hundred every day. um, I can't be eating, you know, brown rice and protein for like every meal it's just not a way to live <laughs> no it's not I agree and and, I, and that's really refreshing I think to hear that you know you it's also a choice like, if you want to do that that's a choice as well yeah but for totally. me it was it's about me feeling good and I think working out for me is is I loved how it made me feel Um, coping with stress as well it's like it's a lifestyle to feel good like I've just I found my form of through actually Victoria's Secret like Pilates is part of my lifestyle so and um so I did a lot of Pilates a lot of Pilates (laughs) and when I when I was oh gosh when I did my first show I was like 20 I just did like 50 squats and a few push-ups because you're 20 years old you're 20 you're 20 20. different then and I was ready for the show yeah okay well and then when I got to (laughs) closer to my 30s it was a few more few more squats yeah a few more squats (laughs) A few more abs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so let's fast forward to one of the shows you did a little bit closer to your 30s where it's a little bit more difficult yeah. to get in shape for one of these things. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so what did your routine look like? How many times a day did you work out? What kind of food did you eat? How do we look like Shanina Shai going oh, down gosh. the runway close to our 30s? For me, this is what works for me, and I say everyone has their own way of working out and what works for them. Um, for me, I would... I would wake up very early, I would do a spin class and then later on do a Pilates class. I was working out two times a day, every day. So both cardio and strength training? Strength training. And I would wake up and have hot water and lemon and kind of like kick your digestive system and what's the word I'm looking for? Metabolism? Metabolism, that's the word. Your your metabolism, I can't, I was so tongue twister today. (laughs) Your metabolism. (laughs) And um, then, yeah, so workout. I would also do boxing as well. I did a lot of boxing. Okay. um, Which I don't do anymore. (laughs) No, I don't either because it kind of hurts my shoulders, but I do love it. Yeah, love it. It's a little stress reliever. (laughs) And then uh, for lunch I would have like a protein brown rice or just protein and vegetables um, and then go to my next workout and probably have like a, a coffee, only black coffee somewhere, lots of water and then, yeah, second workout and then I would go home. Sometimes I would pass out. <laughs> I would be so tired and I would work so hard. I would pass out in my workout gear. I yeah. just, I'm ex- exhausted. I just... Okay, so I think what you're trying to tell everybody <laughs> is training like an angel is actually a full-time job. It's a full-time job. So to look like an angel, it's a full-time job. Yeah. And so that I think is probably why and you're I saying And I don't that do that every no. day. <laughs> no way. I won't do it. No. I refuse. It's not reality for, for most people. It's not reality. Every day. Yeah. Um, so what th- is reality? What do you do now? Reality. Good question. Reality is... Uh, for me, and you know this because you're with me every morning. I do. But they don't know this. <laughs> yes, I'll ask you that <laughs> in just a second. <laughs> What's your reality? <laughs> I um, I get up in the morning. I have a baby now, and Ooh. hopefully I make it to my hopefully I make it to my workout. But it's, is, is your son sleeping through? Yeah, he's not sleeping through the night. Okay, he's a big boy, and he's still not. He is a big boy. Eight thirty p.m. Eight 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 p.m. to three a.m. Okay. Is bliss. Okay, so in so, my world, so you bliss. usually get eight thirty to three a.m. He's asleep. Yep. Do you sleep then? No, because I'm expecting him to wake up. Oh gosh. <laughs> See, that's what I'm always afraid. I don't have any Actually, children. Actually, no. Last night was only eight p.m. to three a.m. Usually, he wakes up at like twelve. Yep. And then 
Yep, and then a three, three, four, and then he wakes up bright eyed at six. Oh my goodness! So this is like, and then I want to go to a workout class, which is amazing workout class. Um, they aren't sponsoring us, so this is. I'm just saying this. No, they are not. They're not sponsored. Uh, Lek Fit. They're amazing and amazing trainer, and it's Pilates, dance. What is it? Pilates, it's rebounder, dance, rebounder, trampoline, strength training. It's all in one. Yep dark room lots of music it's just the best and your skin looks amazing after it as well yeah you do get that nice little after workout glow and i find that it lasts through the day underneath my makeup as well it's in, it's amazing yeah it's, um, shout out to lauren it's amazing <laughs> thank you uh we'll have to get her on here actually because like gosh talk speaking of shows it this class <laughs> <laughs> is the closest thing to watching a vs show when lauren walks in and the stage lights go on and it's all very moody and you just see this oh. like incredibly ripped up human who's just like she's had three kids she's had three kids georgia and i our faces when we <laughs> we did our first class our mouths we had to pick up off the floor it was unbelievable it was truly truly that's why we go there just to watch her yeah basically okay so now <laughs> now we sound like <laughs> okay so back to your routine so okay so what you're telling me is now you're a mother you're extremely tired <laughs> I'm extremely tired um you lucky sometimes I made it here today <laughs> you're lucky you made it here today so um so I know how many workouts a week you want to hit you want to yeah. hit like three to five because mm-hmm. that's what I am for as well yeah how many workouts a week are you actually getting in right now <laughs> one <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay. And then what does your diet look like right now? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you in my head? <laughs> I think it's interesting it's for people here. to know, you know. So last night, I'll tell you, it's not good. Okay. <laughs> I have an idea of what I would like my diet to look like. And it's important because it's important to have your energy as a mom and just in general to survive as a human being. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have like a coffee in the morning and if I can get some type of fruit in and like <laughs> and get that on the go. But uh, last night I really didn't have, uh, yes, sorry, excuse me. Yesterday I didn't really have a lot of time to eat because I was dealing with the baby. I was on emails. Yeah. I was working and I kind of just had a late lunch dinner. Um, you had a dinner. What was your dinner? I had <laughs> um, my my partner ordered from one of my favorite restaurants. We had like steak, potatoes, pasta, and so you a just salad. went for it. Yeah, he yeah. had like all the <laughs> cuisines, like all the what you need. And then I was still hungry, and I ordered uh, Shake Shack <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> And I ate it all. I mean, I'm sorry. The 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 contrast between training for Victoria's Secret and being a mum. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I feel like a lot of people will relate to that and I will probably appreciate hearing that because all the mums out there that are watching you and your career and, and, and all of your friends and how you all look are probably like, oh, my God, I'm exhausted. I've never got time for that. Yeah. Well, they don't have time either. Well, let's talk about you, Georgia. My health journey. Let's talk about your health journey. It's your health journey – is really, really interesting. Um, And I think, yeah, your story is really powerful and really, really interesting. And I think it's quite cool. Even though, you know, you you dealt with a lot, you're a really strong woman. Um, And I think it's amazing of like what your health journey was and what it is and what it's led to as well. Yeah. I mean, in some some ways it's, look, my health journey is still ongoing, but... um, I had a really pivotal moment in my life uh, in my early 20s. This was actually before I was a DJ. For those who don't know, I'm a DJ um, and a music producer. But prior to that, I was a TV host in Australia um, on a popular show on a big network called Channel 9. And my show was live every Saturday morning. It was called Kids WB. Um, And everything was going great, or so I thought, until one day I started to feel a bit unwell and I went to the doctor and she ran some tests and she told me to go and get an MRI. And I thought, why am I going to get an MRI? And she said, oh, you might have like a tiny little brain tumour. How, how old were you? I was 21. That's and she said, you might have a tiny little brain tumour. I said, brain tumour? She said, oh, don't worry, with the size of a pinhead, it's not, not a big deal. I said, oh, okay. So she sent me off for the MRI. In the meantime, she ran another blood test And then as I'm driving to the MRI, I get another call and it's the doctor. And she said, hi, where are you? And I said, oh, I'm actually driving to the MRI right now. And she said, oh, okay, well, as soon as you get the scan, bring it straight to my office. This was 5 p.m. on a Friday. 
I said, okay. Were you like worried in that moment? Oh like, yeah. What's and going I was on? Like, like, what? Speakerphone, and my mum's in the car, oh. and I just look over at my mum. I'm like, oh god, this isn't good. Um, and so we get the scan, and I remember walking out of the uh, the place that does the MRIs, radiographer, I think, and uh, everyone was just staring at me. Stop. Really? Yeah. And because they can't actually give you the, your results, the doctors have to do it. But I remember going, what is going on here? They're all just looking. So they give me my scans. I leave. I drive straight to the doctor's office. I walk into the doctor's office. I hand her the scans. My mum and I are standing on the other side of her desk. She falls back in her chair. Stop. Wow. And she says, I don't know how to tell you this. I've never seen a larger brain tumour in, in someone who's living in this position. Mm-mm. And my mum's just gone white. And I looked at her and I looked at the doctor and I said, am I going to live? And she said, I don't know. I was like, oh, great. Um, <laughs> she said her reaction is great. <laughs> so um, this was actually – sorry, I was 22. This was on my 23rd birthday. Wasn't there signs – there was some signs yes. that were you thought there was something wrong as well. I there remember was. You t- yeah. Yeah, so I started to get sick I think at about 15 years old. So, I mean, this didn't thing didn't appear instantly. It grew over time. Um, I remember going on a trip to Europe with my mother Mm -hmm. and I got on the plane and I fell asleep on the plane and then I got to uh, Paris airport and I remember there was this really long line of people Mm. to go through customs and I turned around to my mum and I sort of said this is a joke. I said, oh, mum, should I pretend to faint so we can get through the line faster? And she's like, oh, yeah, good one. Neck minute, I literally faint. <laughs> like, <laughs> it wasn't even a joke. And my mom's standing there she's and she's like, like, she's, yeah, like yes, get get up. she's like kind of kicking me, going, get up, get up, get up, get <laughs> up. <laughs> and, uh, and so I didn't get up. And so then all of a sudden they, they actually came, carried us through. <laughs> Did you manifest that? I manifested that. <laughs> Except the problem was for the next two weeks of our vacation, our mother-daughter vacation, I slept the entire time. Mm. Like could not keep my eyes open. Didn't even really wake up for food. I'd wake up for like three minutes and go back to sleep. Mm. Um, and then after that my period stopped totally. That's when, yeah. Um, and then after that I started to faint and then after that I started to go a little bit blind in this mm, eye. Mm-hmm. Um, so there were definitely signs that were there, um, mostly because of I lost my period and I had cramps and that kind of thing. The, the doctors initially thought it was one of two things. They thought it was either endometriosis mm-hmm. or um, another favourite diagnosis of about ten doctors I went to, which were mostly men, nothing against men, but just happened to be men, <laughs> uh, was, oh, she's skinny. Look how skinny she is. Does she eat? She looks like she has an eating disorder. Oh, wow. Most of them came to that conclusion without actually running any tests on me. Um, and so in the end the doctor that actually diagnosed me, funnily enough, was a gynecologist. Wow. Found the brain tumour. It's so go figure that. The gynecologist found the brain <laughs> Yeah, she's long. No, I'm joking. Oh. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, she rests. George's she... humour. <laughs> Sorry. It's very dark. You guys will get to know that side of me pretty yeah. soon. Australians and dark humour. Yeah, exactly. You'll get to figure that out. Yeah. Um, so anyway, she uh, she ran some blood tests. But it was funny when I went to see her, she said, oh, you've probably had a thousand of these. And I said, no. Mm. She said, what, no one's run a blood test on you? I said, no. <laughs> she said, oh, okay, well, let's start there. And, and it was I had very raised prolactin. So that's how she figured out that it was a brain tumour. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, fast forward, my diagnosis has happened. I get referred to an endocrinologist um, because of my hormone levels. Um, she runs further testing on me. They decide, Initially I'm booked in for surgery that week. They, they decided to cancel my surgery the day before because they thought that my tumour was uh, the type of tumour tum- that would respond to medication. Um, they put me on a medication called Dostonex, which is um, uh, dopamine. Mm-hmm. I had a very adverse re- reaction to it. I lost – they had me on it for two years to shrink my tumour down because it was the size of a golf ball and it was wrapped around my carotid artery. So mm. to get it out, they had to shrink it down to a certain size. Um I had a horrible reaction to this medication. It made me depressed. Uh, I think I got down to about 90 pounds on it. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and uh, I lost my balance. Like it was just horrible. Yeah. And actually, if you if you look online, online there was actually a class action against the company at the time because really? a lot of people were going through this. They also they also reported all these other really weird side effects like compulsive shopping. <laughs> <laughs> But it's a true story, I swear. (laughs) Anyway, um, long story short, when I was diagnosed, I was – I had a pretty hectic filming schedule. So very sadly I had to leave my TV show, Mm -hmm. which was – Really hard for me because now you're back. That was Look my at you. Look at me. I'm you're back. Back on TV. Sure. Um, I was really depressed about it at the time, and um, that's actually how I found DJing. Yes. So this is amazing. Yeah. So you just like never who? Know. First of all, like you going through that is just like I can't imagine like all the feelings and you're not feeling your best and you decided you're in bed in the hospital and you're like. I want to do – I want to start DJing. Well, it actually happened before that. So it happened when I was on all the crazy drugs. Okay. So <laughs> what does that tell you? Yeah. No. But you're good at it. So it's not like something <laughs> – Thank you. No, what happened was I w- – because I had such issues with my balance mm. um, and I also just was feeling really sad all the time, um, I didn't really want to leave my house. It was a real hassle to get out the door. And so I would spend most days just lying on the couch watching TV. Which, of course, made me even more depressed. Of course. Yeah. Um, and so a friend of mine who was actually winding up his DJ career and I'd always kind of joked around with him about wanting to do it because I love music and, you know, I was that kid that always loved going to underage dance parties and stuff. So um, he, when he found out what I was going through, he called me and he said, hey, you know how you've always joked around about wanting to be a DJ? Well, you know, I'm not using my decks right now. Why don't I bring them around to your house and give you a lesson and then you can – you can figure it out. Mm. So he did. He brought these this really crappy old pair of CDJ 800s with cigarette burns in them and uh, this book of CDs. That's what it was back then. There was no such thing as USBs or laptops or any of that I stuff forget. to DJ. Had CDs. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was like it was vinyl or CDs. And so there are all these burnt crappy quality CDs and he's like, okay, this is how you work this button, this is how you work this button and this is the general idea. you got to mix this song into this song. And then he left me to my own devices. So I sat there for the next three months while I was waiting to have my surgery and I just pushed buttons and got it wrong and practised until eventually I could mix two records together and then I had my surgery and then after I recovered, um, some of the newspaper outlets and publications kind of knew who I was and um, and they'd heard on the grapevine that I'd been learning to DJ because not a lot of women were doing it at the time. Yeah. Um, and the it was the Herald Sun in Melbourne yeah. that actually invited me to DJ their Christmas party. Oh, wow. And so I went and did it. And that's a I big – it's like what is that in the United like – The LA Times. The LA Times. Or like even the New York, New York Times. Times. Yeah, New York that's Times. kind of the equivalent. It is New York Times. So I played their Christmas party and I was bloody terrible. <laughs> 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 but I loved it. It was the first time in years that I actually felt really happy doing something. Mm. And I remember my plan was to go straight back into TV. I had had no plans whatsoever to turn DJing into a career. Mm. But the TV thing just wasn't really happening as fast as I thought it would. Um, I think people were quite confused as to why I left my TV show um, because at the time a decision was made uh, by the network not to tell the public about my health condition because I was on a kid's show and I think they felt that might scare the kids, (laughs) which to be honest with you I really regret. I wish I'd just been honest and truthful about it because, yeah. you know, I, I think I think it's important to share the truth but whatever, you can't go back in time. Yeah. Um, but the DJing was really happening. Mm-hmm. Like I was getting a lot of offers to do stuff. Um, so I thought, bugger it, I'm just going to focus on this. So I did. DJed for a few years in Australia and then the opportunity came up to move to the US. I got an O1 visa, then I got the green card. Um, and then you – how old were you when you ca- when you came over here? I was actually in my mid-20s, late yep. 20s. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in my 20s. Yeah. Came o- so I moved over here and I m- happened to move at a time where there still wasn't really many female DJs doing it in I don't think the there's US. still – well, is there still? It's a lot more now. Georgia's in a very competitive yes. industry. As of you? 
<laughs> yeah, but you're competing against like men all the time and frowned upon because you are a woman. Oh yeah, that's, yeah, that's been definitely. I, I feel like women are celebrated a lot more now in the industry than they were. But I mean, God, we could, that's a whole other conversation about sexism in in another episode. <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> in the industry. But anyway, so moved across to the US, um, a, a, a rather large nightclub group and restaurant group over here called H Wood took a chance on me very early. Um, Shout out Don Terzian and the rest of the crew. Don't think I've forgotten you. I'm very <laughs> grateful. Um, and and they started giving me gigs in some of their hottest nightclubs in LA. I started out doing every Friday night at the Nice Guy, which was really popping back mm-hmm. at the time. Um, and, you know, then went and played some of their other clubs like Bootsy Bellows, Hooray Henry's. Wow. Warwick, which isn't, with, isn't an H-Wood club, but I also played there pretty early. And then within six months, I scored my first Vegas residency. Yes, you did. With Wynn. <laughs> and I went uh, and I was playing there. And then from there, it just grew and grew and grew. And, and that's a funny story. Are. That's how Georgia and I met, actually. It is. Through the DJ yes. world. I don't DJ. I wish I I wish I could, and I, I, you know, today I wish I. What's stopping you? I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Hmm, But I, my mind is ticking (laughs) over. (laughs) So I met Georgia through my ex-husband, who was was a DJ. Is a DJ? Yes. Very well-known DJ. Yeah. And that's how we crossed paths. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And being Thanks. Australian. Thank you, Ruckus. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, and then also being Australian and from Melbourne. Yeah. That's kind of funny and weird. I know. Everyone asked if we met at home and we didn't. We met here. Yeah, we met here. But it's been so nice having you here. It feels like having family here. Yes. It's it really, really important. Does. Having a support system is really important. And Georgia and I are pretty much, you know, true blue Aussies, you know, in the US. And we are. We don't have any family here. No, we don't. It's just us. I have now a, a son and... So you do have family. I, <laughs> I have family. Added, yeah. you know, added family. I have a dog and a cat. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this is why we're here. But your story is just... I, I think it's such an awesome story. Like how... Thank you. And why? And that's why you're here. I think it's... I, your health afterwards. I don't know. Like, but it's still... It's ongoing, yeah. yeah. You're still dealing with a lot. I am. So the the only downside I'll say to my DJ career is that it's been very, very taxing on my body um, because being a DJ, I travel a lot. Mm-hmm. I'm on planes. I think prior to the pandemic, I was taking about 200 flights a year. Yeah, and uh, me too. <laughs> yeah, you too, exactly. Yeah. So you understand this well. Yes. And as glamorous and fun as that sounds, and it is glamorous and fun in a lot of ways, mm-hmm. Um, it's also very taxing. There would be a lot of weekends where I wouldn't even see a bed. I'd just sleep upright on plane seats. Um, and while that's all well and good when you're a bit younger, when you hit your 30s, it's a little bit harder. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so the pandemic hits. Um, I, I What do you do? <laughs> For DJs, like what? Well, I'm not going to lie. For the first six weeks, I, uh, I, I did Netflix full time. <laughs> I, I had no interest in working whatsoever. Like, this is great. I thought, I'm going to I'm going to find something wonderful in all yeah. this uh, in all this, this chaos and hard hardness, which mm-hmm. is rest. Yeah. Uh, so I rested for the first six weeks, um, and I was fortunate enough not to get COVID for about a year. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I did eventually catch COVID Mm-mm. and then right after that. I'm laughing because <laughs> I'm only really just like giggling myself because unfortunately COVID is absolutely terrible and it's affected so many lives and in so many ways. But Georgia and I seem to be COVID buddies. Like we got co- we We're synced. <laughs> we're synced. It's so weird. And we've had COVID four times now. We both have had COVID four times. But and here's the, the weird same, part. Yeah. We're not in the same place ever. When we've had it, we're literally every time we've had COVID, it's been we've been in different countries. Yes. So I don't know what that's about, but anyway. Anyway. So I caught COVID. Um, and then about a month later, I was due to go back to Australia. And at the time they were only letting you back into Australia if you've been vaccinated. Mm. So I was vaccinated. Um, I don't know whether it was the COVID itself or the vaccination, um, but something overloaded my already weak immune system. Um, and I ha- it triggered an autoimmune condition. 
So for the past two years, I've had recurring migraines. Um, I've had terrible aches and pains. I've had um, nerve pains. So I've got like this really weird shooting pain up my shoulder. Like pins and that, needles, like yeah, I get feeling. pins and needles down my arm. I get this like weird stabbing pain in the back of my arm. Yeah. Um, and I've had a bit of depression associated with that as well. I'm sure. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been really difficult to be honest because I feel like it, it's kind of brought up a lot of emotions from when I was sick waiting for my surgery because that's sort of what it felt like. Mm. Um, and it's just, I, I'm sure it would be very scary for you as well. It was scary. To, like, to, well, even right now, you're like, what's going on with my body? What's happening? I'm well, not yeah, sure. like I, uncertainty. And, I, and here's the thing. It's really difficult to test for this stuff. I, I went to the doctor. I had every test, I had every blood test, everything. They're like, oh, yeah, nothing's showing up. You're fine. I'm like, I'm not fine, mm. dude, like not fine. I think what what's important from what you're saying as well, like trust your gut and know. Oh, absolutely. And ask questions and well, get if, if third I'm, opinions. A million percent. If I hadn't trusted my gut over my brain tumour, and gone and seen doctor after doctor after they told me I'm fine or I'm too skinny or, or I have endometriosis or whatever, mm-hmm. I wouldn't have been diagnosed. That tumour would have kept growing and I would have died. Mm-hmm. So 100% trust your gut. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, it's because of that lesson that I kept going through this process and I decided, you know what, no, I feel sick and I'm going to fix it. Mm-hmm. Um, and because... DJing and touring is my main source of income. Uh, Throughout this illness, I've continued to tour and I just found that I've had to take a lot of breaks. You guys might have noticed I'm not on the road as much at Mm -hmm. the moment. I haven't spoken about it a lot on social media, but the reason for that is because I haven't been well. Um, I've I've been able to sort of handle short bursts of work, but I've really needed a lot of rest while I've had to figure this out. Um, we were in Australia and we were going out and I remember like, I was re- I was like mum's night out for me. I was really excited. Yeah. And G- Georgia would come back from it. She's like, I just need a 20 minute nap yeah. or an hour nap. I come and I was like, wow, you were, you were napping. I was not you okay. Were, yeah. You were exhausted. Yeah. I was exhausted. And that's not me. Like, yeah. You know me. I can oh, bounce around from firecracker. <laughs> oh, firecracker. I can bounce around from state to state, play shows <laughs> without, on no sleep. Team no sleep. Yeah. Yeah, it's not me now. (laughs) (laughs) So I think that sort of reignited my interest in wellness. Mm -hmm. Um, And I really have tried so many different modalities to fix my ailments and a lot of them have worked. Um, This I have spoken about on social media. The main one for me that's actually really helped me is NAD peptide therapy. So if you guys are going through what I'm going through, and I know a lot of people are. Yeah after COVID, after the vaccine, after all that. Um, Definitely speak to your doctor about NAD. It changed my life. Um, But, yeah, so fast forward, here we are. Yeah. You have a lot to offer in the wellness space. Doing a wellness podcast. (laughs) Wellness, lifestyle. We have, I have, like, even just now we're talking about, like, being a mom and, gosh, I've learned so much um, about myself and, you know, understanding I've I really support women after having a baby. I bet you do. I always support women, but I just – hats off to women and mums, like what our mothers did and what women do across the world. And just giving birth is just the experience and journey. Postpartum and hormones, um, I can't explain how real it is. I'm a very – I'm kind of person. if I get down, I can kind of snap myself out of it. You know, everyone has their down moments and not feeling good or being negative in their thoughts and worry. I worry quite a bit. But what I've learned through my experience of postpartum is your hormones and just what you deal with, it creates a depression. So you had postpartum depression. I haven't been diagnosed, but I'm pretty sure um, I am dealing with postpartum depression. So you're still in it. Yeah. How old's your son? Eight months. So you're still going eight months later, you're still feeling it. Yeah. And I didn't know till later, like it can go for a year. Wow. Yeah. So My goodness, what women deal with, yes. honestly. Yeah, like behind, you know, closed doors, um, I'm consistently crying, um, just dep- yeah, depressed, didn't want to get out of bed. And your mental, like, 
strength is so important to raise a baby. And of course, I just want to be my best for yeah. my child and be But you're alert. not feeling your best. Yeah, and there's lack of sleep. And then, you know, the, your support system is so important, you know, especially especially for first time moms it's really important to have that support system and not feel judged or being told what to do um just guidance to have that you know is really really important and how do you manage that because I, I imagine a lot of people have opinions it's i think you can it's it's different for everybody i think you there's ways to manage it like i think therapy is really important finding a community of women to like talk about what's going on. I find that's really therapeutic for me. Um, I'm very lucky in this moment. My my best friends uh, decided, oh, you know, we've grown up together pretty much. We've partied together and seen the world together. And we're like settling down, married, having babies. So I've had a group of girlfriends that, you know, have given birth within the year. Yeah, and that was crazy. Everybody got pregnant at once. <laughs> yes. And, but having those honest conversations and talking about it. And I'm not afraid to talk about it here because it's real and I think we should talk about it and be really explicit about what's happening. And I think, yeah, no, and this is the first time I'm talking about it it's on like on camera, so, and, but it's, um, yeah, I'm still dealing with it and it's really, really hard. It, you know, you have your extreme highs and there's extreme lows and uncertainty and George has been my, like my friend therapist as well and Knew, you knew something was going on as well. You should like... Oh, when I did, because yeah. you were out of sorts. Yeah. And initially I think I thought it was just that you were exhausted. Yeah. Yeah. But... And then I thought... You you do... I mean, you touched on it briefly. A lot of mothers get... get People like to tell new mums what to do, especially first-time mums. Yeah. And I could tell that there was a lot of that happening as well and you were feeling a lot of pressure there. But I, I, it took me a while to sort of realise that perhaps it was something more than that, that perhaps it was postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So currently I'm in therapy and therapy is very therapeutic for me. I love that. It's going well. Yeah. I, I, I like it. I love it. Um, you know, I, I'm very strong. I'm very independent. So um, this is probably the first time we had to bow down and be and be like, okay, I'm not okay. I need to. I think I need to see someone and talk to somebody about my feelings and what's going on, so I can be better for myself, but especially for Zai as well, um, my my son. So yeah, I'm here. Yeah, We're I here. think that's amazing, and I think it's really important and special that you've been vulnerable with everybody and shared that today because I feel like there's a lot of people who will be listening to this going, oh, I can relate to a lot of this. Yeah. And haven't – have maybe felt some – I mean, there's a lot of stigma and shame around going to therapy still, mm -hmm. which is sort of ridiculous in 2023, especially what we went through with the pandemic. Um, and there shouldn't be. So I think to look at you, somebody like you, who looks the way you do with your gorgeous life that, you know, that – I mean – I. I'm your best friend and I look at your life. I'm like, I want Shanina's life. And I, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a lot going on. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, you do have a very, very um, aspirational mm -hmm. life from the outside. To hear that you have been through this and you are still going through this and you had to stick your hand up and ask for help, I feel like that's something that could perhaps be helpful to some people listening. Yeah. I, I think – we should be more honest with ourselves and talk about it. And I know there's a lot more, I'm sure my friends as well, they don't probably talk about it, but like, yeah, there's a lot more women that don't talk about having postpartum depression. Yeah. That, well, maybe they will after maybe. hearing this. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, that's probably a great place to wrap up actually. I feel yes. like <laughs> that's, it, that's the aim of the game with this podcast. That's why we wanted to do this is because we wanted to tap in with as many wellness experts and not just wellness experts, no, yeah. just other friends in yeah. our network who have all sorts of interesting lives and careers and family dynamics and upbringings. People um, in our industry, like people in the industry that you might know, like our listeners, and then really like, like you said, they they have this idea and stereotype of how their life might be, but what is their real story? And what's like the how, real story? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And how do they manage their crazy lives? Mm -hmm. How do they achieve 80-20? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we've got a lot of interesting guests coming up in the next few weeks. Hope you guys have loved listening to us today yes. as much as we've loved being here. Absolutely. Um, I hope you've gotten something from this episode. 
Uh, we'd love to hear from you as well on our Instagram, on our TikTok, YouTube, wherever else you're listening to this. It's at 8020pod, all spelled out. Um, and yeah, reach out to us and hope you'll tune in again soon. Thank you, guys. <laughs>